Howdy, all you beautiful ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching this episode or listening to this episode of the podcast. Um, today, I'm going to do how to make a living at music part two. Um, my last episode was how to make a living at music, and I didn't intend on doing a part two. However, when I was done with it, I realized how many things I didn't cover. And so even throughout this episode, I'm it's, it's hard to even... Uh, discuss everything that needs discussed when it comes to making a living at music. This episode is going to be equally geared towards producers and engineers and artists and musicians, session players. It's pretty much going to be geared towards everyone. So here we go. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, I would be immensely honored if you would um, hit the little subscribe tab and hit the bell icon next to it so that way you get notified when I drop new podcasts and I'm doing like studio vlog studio build vlogs and I've got a, a video covering all of Nam and my favorite things at Nam and a bunch of different things that I'm I'm doing on YouTube. Uh, if you are on Instagram, hit me up at Cole Caparoon. If you're on Facebook you can also hit me up at Cole Caparoon. Uh, those are my those are my three big things. If uh, I'm a producer, I'm a mix engineer, I'm a session guitarist. I do some mastering. I do some artist development. Um, if you are interested in any of that, hit up coltcaparoon.com, and I would love to at least have the conversation with you. Um, see if I'm the right person for you. I think that's really important. Choosing the right people to work with. Uh, so. I would love to d discuss your project and your music and your career. Here we go. So I touched on this a little bit on the last one, but one of the things that I, I see, uh, I don't see a lot of people discuss. Um, it was This was a big part of my talk at Belmont on how to make a living in the modern music era. Um, I've touched on this a little bit in previous episodes, but... The thing that I never hear people, other people talk about is the quantity of work, the quantity of gigs, the quantity of sessions. It's literally all the same thing regardless of what it is that you're doing. Uh, the quantity of relationships. I don't really hear people discuss the quantity of these things that is necessary um, to make a living at music. And so I'm going to try to break this down uh, and touch on it like per per position, whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're an artist and you're wanting to play shows, let's talk about quantity of shows. You can probably play the same venue every six months, I think. Um, I think much more than that, you run the risk of oversaturating and not uh, not drawing a good enough crowd. So let's, let's use once every six months. Let's say that you want to play. I'm going to have to break out the calculator for all of these. So trusty calculator, phone slash calculator. Um, so let's say that you want to play every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you want to play four days a week. It could be any four days a week. It doesn't have to be those days. Let's say you want to play four days a week as an artist. Um, and But you want to play, let's say that you're going to play every venue if you're going to set up a rotation. We're just doing this for how for the ease of the math. I keep making references about ease of the math throughout these episodes. So you want to play four days a week times 52 weeks. That's 208 shows per year. And then you can divide that in half if you want to play each show every six months. Uh, so you're looking at 104 venues that you need relationships with the promoters, um, relationships with the clubs or the booking agent, whoever it is. You need 108 of those in order to actually stay busy as an artist. And this, like I said, this quantity is something that I don't see a lot of people talk about. Um, as a producer, if I, if it takes me three days to do a single, I did touch on this on one of the previous episodes. If it takes me three days to do a single and I want to work six days a week, that means I need to do two artists. If, if all my artists are just doing singles, I need to do two artists per week. Um, and let's say it's a pretty common for artists to release a single every six months. Um, I would like to see more than that, but let's say six months. 
So if I do two a week, that's 104, uh, 104 singles a year. And I need, if, if everyone's uh, return customers and I'm doing two a year for everyone, that means I need 52 artists per year to stay busy and make a living. Now, of course, there's a lot of flexibility in this. If you're doing EPs or full-length albums, if you're full producing, if you're just mixing, if you're just mastering, I've seen some mastering guys here in town uh, discuss that they're like like over a thousand songs in a year. Um, myself in 2018, last year, I worked on 154 songs. Uh, and that was, some of those are full production. Some of those were uh, just mixing. Some of those were just mastering. Some of those were mixing and mastering. Some of those were just playing guitar on, but I worked on 154 songs in 2018 and that's what it took for me to stay busy. Um, and so figuring out like what it is that you do and uh, looking at it like that, like how much work, how, what quantity of work and what quantity of people do I need to work with or what quantity of venues do I need to work with is like, it's so important to, to really wrap your head around, um, how many people you need to network with. Uh, so I don't hear enough people talk about that. And I think that's one of the very most overlooked parts of, uh, of this whole making a living at music thing and really of, uh, of any entrepreneurial thing at all. And I always reference to, to a carpenter, you know, if, uh, if you're remodeling houses and let's say you're just doing kitchen remodels and let's say each kitchen remodel takes you three weeks as a contractor and you want to stay busy and you want to work three out of four weeks every single year, which is that's a probably a good place to start then you need to do uh what one kitchen per month that means you need to do uh 12 full kitchen remodels you know you could you could break this down in in whatever terms that you want from whatever position that you're in but that quantity i think is super important i think it's uh it's really important to look at things that way um because it is in my opinion that and the quality of songs and, well, the overall quality of your photos, your music videos, and your productions and your songs. But the quantity of work and the quality are the two things that hold everyone back. Uh, most people. It holds most people back. I need to not make blanket statements because there's, uh, there's, there, there's just too wide of a variety of people. But anyway, I think it's something that's really important to pay attention to and to look at and try to break down for yourself and for what it is that you're doing. Um, and then you can, you know, you can go from there. So uh, the other thing uh, that I don't see a lot of people talking about is uh, investing in your band. So if you're an artist, again, there's going to be a bunch of topics here. And some of this is going to be for artists and some of it's going to be for producer engineers and it's all over the place. So there's, but the, these principles apply to just about everyone. So you can take these principles and apply it to what it is that you do. Um, I think it's really important as a, if you're a new artist or a new ish artist, it's really important to have a stellar band, a ridiculously killer band. Um, and I think, uh, oftentimes in the beginning, you're not getting paid if at all, which we're going to get to that. That's the topic I'm going to discuss is, is how to get paid and how to charge. Uh, you're not going to get paid anything, if anything, but not enough to pay a truly stellar band. So what I suggest to people is that you view your band, the first whole bunch of shows when you're making your entrance as an artist, uh, you want the very best band that you can possibly afford because what that does is you then go on stage and you kill it. And that usually means you have more opportunities from that promoter or from that club or from that whoever to get asked back to play again. And if you hire a, a mediocre band or even let's say a, a crappy band, um, you know, they're not going to hire you back. So having a killer band is super important when you're launching as an artist. I mean, it's important across the spectrum, all the way up to the top. But what I would encourage people to do is to look at your band 
as an investment, just like an artist comes to me and they pay me to produce them. It's an investment. They're paying me X amount of dollars to produce a song. Then I give them a song, which they can then promote. I think it's a really good idea to look at your band that same way. Um, you want to put your best foot forward. And sometimes, hopefully not for very long, sometimes you may have to input more money into your band than you are making. But if you look at it that as an investment in your career and you're investing in your career and in yourself as an artist so that way you will get more opportunities in the future, I think that that's also something that uh, I never hear people talk about, <clears throat> but it is a real thing. Um, which kind of gets into this next part of like playing for free. We're going to get back to all the producer engineer stuff, uh, but artists for now paying, playing for free or paying to play or how much you're making. This is, a, I probably could do an entire episode just on, uh, playing for free or paying to play, but I'm going to try to brush through it real quick. You are, uh, it's not likely that you're going to be able to charge a thousand dollars for a 30 minute original set at your first show. It's not likely you're going to be able to charge that at your fifth show or at your 10th show, maybe not even at your hundredth show, hopefully by your hundredth show. But I'm set, the point is that, um, it's really difficult to, uh, know exactly what to charge. And it's difficult for a lot of artists who think that, that, you know, if they can't afford to pay the band or they can't afford to get to the venue or, or whatever, based on what they're making, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. It's a hard thing. So I think the important thing is to try to look at this super big picture and try to look at it long-term over the course of your career. And potentially, potentially, that's totally not how you say that word, <laughs> potentially view it as an investment in your career. And you might have to take the hit um, to get into a venue or to have the opportunity to open for a, a large artist or whatever. It's entirely possible that, that you might spend more than you make to play the show, even if you're actually getting paid to play the show. And so this whole balance of... Um, this next bunch of things kind of all fits together. This whole balance of how much you get paid, how much does it cost to get to and from the show, how much are you paying your band, um, or maybe you're even paying to play, which a lot of people are super against paying to play. But there, and I have had been for a very long time completely against paying to play. However, I think that there are a very uh, unique set of circumstances where it actually makes sense to pay to play. But you, it is still a risk, but this whole thing is a risk because you're a business owner and you're an entrepreneur, and so you are taking risks. That's literally what you're doing. Um, so if you are, let's say, let's take the worst case scenario and say that you're paying to play. If you're paying to play and you're paying your band and you're paying your travel to and from the show. Usually there's at least one meal involved if you're not too far away. Um, you can be out some substantial money just to do the show. But the, the specific circumstances where I think this makes sense is with merch. It's entirely possible for you to pay $1,000. We're going to use big round numbers here. It's entirely possible for you to pay $1,000 to get an opening slot on a show where there will be 5,000 people at. And as long as you, as an artist, have it together, you have great songs, you've hired a great band. This is kind of where this all fits together into this, into this puzzle like that. It fits together. And if you have a great band and you have great songs and you put on a great show and you have great merch, it's entirely possible for you to pay $1,000 to get on this show. You play in front of 5,000 people and you end up making three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 at the merch booth. Happens all the time. I've been on those shows. I've been the guitar player for the artist where that has happened. Um, and so for the right set of circumstances, it's, I think it is okay to pay to play. 
It's also okay to play for free. If you get the opportunity to play in front of thousands of people for free and your band is super on point and your music is on point and your merch is on point, it's entirely likely that you could play a show for free and make thousands of dollars at your merch table, depending on how many people are there and depending on how well you fit with the headlining artist. Cause that's a, that's another variable. You know, if obviously if, if what you do doesn't really fit with the headline artist and the headline artist is who is bringing the people who's selling the tickets. Um, so you have to counterbalance all of this stuff. And that's again that all of these episodes are like there's so much it depends and so what I what I what I want to do what I what I, what I, I got a stuttering problem apparently what I want to do is I want to I want to set out these mindsets and these principles and by the end of this series if you've watched every episode you will have the the concept of how to navigate this making a living at music um, and and how to uh, all so, all facets of of being an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial I can't talk for nothing today of being an entrepreneur and uh, and, and how to navigate being an entrepreneur and, and making a living at music so that's again that's my focus is to get people from wherever they are to the point where they make a living on music in as short as time shortest span and most efficiently as possible so merch killer merch have killer merch make sure your designs are on point make sure you know all of the the that you're using like high quality merch stuff that people actually want to wear and stuff that people will actually want to spend money on that's a big part of it um and then again part of this whole thing too is i have a lot specifically with people i'm developing and specifically with clients, I have a lot of conversations about what people should charge for shows. Now we're getting back into this covers all facets of this music thing, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're a producer or an engineer or a songwriter or an artist, a front of house guy, doesn't matter. What should you charge? The one thing I see a lot of people that I feel like a lot of people get wrong uh, and I've boiled this down over the years to this specific concept is that your demand determines your worth, not your talent. Uh, I, I really, really believe this. And I think if you can uh, set your mindset like this, it's so much easier to, dis- to literally decide dollars and cents wise what you're worth. Just because you're a good singer just because you're good uh, have good songs just because your band is fantastic it doesn't mean that you're worth anything to get paid this is not a popular opinion and this is kind of going against the the trend nowadays of like like know your worth and like and don't don't give up for free give up what you do for free but at the end of the day what you what you have to realize is it's an entire music industry ecosystem And unfortunately, it is driven by money. And so everyone involved has to get paid or they just won't do it anymore. If I can't get paid to to produce for people, I can't pay my bills, which means I have to go get a job, which means I can't do this anymore. So you as an artist are the same way. The promoter is the same way. The club is the same way. The security at the club is the same way. The front of house guy that mixes you at the club is the same way. It's all, it all is the same thing. We all have to get paid or else, uh, we can't do it. So as an artist, we're going to talk artist, and then we're going to talk producer and engineer and on down the line. So as an artist, uh, Again, I don't think it's a a popular opinion, but I really believe it's how the world works and how the music industry works, that your demand determines your worth, not your talent. So it doesn't matter if you're the most talented thing anyone has ever heard. Now, they're not mutually exclusive. They, They do play off of each other for sure, because the more talented you are, the more people are into what you do, which means your demand goes up. But if you look at it just as your demand determines your worth, um, you then get to say, okay, you're an artist. You're going to play Boise, Idaho. How many tickets can you sell in Boise, Idaho? 10? 100? 10,000? How many tickets can you sell? How many people will pay to come watch you play? That determines your worth. 
solely. That solely determines your worth of what you can charge as an artist. Um, you might be able to charge more than your worth and, and some promoters or clubs will take a chance on you. But if it doesn't work out for them and they lose money on you, they won't have you back. And so it's important to, to keep this in mind and it really will help you set what it is that you are worth. Um, so yeah, uh, with, as a producer, same thing. You could be the best producer or the best mix engineer on planet earth. And if no one is actually hiring you, what, what are you actually worth? Now, again, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. If you're re a really talented producer, a really talented mix engineer, chances are uh, that gets around and, and people want that. And so they hire you. But but it's still driven by the demand, not by the fact that you're talent. You have to be talented to create the demand, but you can be talented and not have any demand. There are guitar players here in town who are phenomenal, phenomenal in Nashville. I'm in Nashville for those of you that don't know. There's guitar players here that are ridiculous and uh, they're also difficult to work with, uh, trying to be nice and respectful. They're phenomenal and difficult to work with. And so no one will hire them. And so it, it, it doesn't matter that they're fantastic because no one's hiring them and they're baristas at the coffee shop because no one will hire them because they're difficult to work with. So again, your demand is, is the determining factor, not your talent. Um, and this spreads through everything. So again, it's a concept that I think is important. If you can wrap your head around that and if you can base what you're charging or if you can at very at the very least work on pushing your career based on that along with your art, that I think is a much better way to do it. Enough about that. Um, so let's talk about your website and your EPK. Um, this is going to go kind of hand in hand. I have a website as a producer, as a mix engineer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you also need an, a website as those things or as an artist, but also as an artist, you need an EPK. So I'm going to talk about some, some really general principles on your website or your EPK that I think are important for people to follow. And first, I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> I've had two meetings today already, and my voice is roached. And I'm just coming off a of NAM, where you just scream at people because it's so loud in there. You just scream at people all day, every day for three days straight. Anyway, um, the general thing that I think is important to realize, and you can base most of everything you do with your website and with your EPK off of this, is that uh, every time you require someone to click on something again to find what it is they're looking for, the chances that they will actually follow through goes down exponentially. And I don't remember the percentages. I read a study on this not too long ago. So if you post a link, if you, let's say you're an artist and you're sending a promoter your EPK for their consideration, you have to put a link in the email to your EPK. It's something like 50%. It's like a 50-50 chance if they're even going to click on that link. Now, let's say they do and they click on the link and there's a couple things that a promoter wants to see in order for you to consider you to book you for a show. Um, jaw dropping photos, music, and hopefully photos. And this is my opinion, but it is kind of widely accepted that this is this is the norm. Uh, a jaw dropping photo of you as an artist, your music and hopefully some photos of some other big shows proving that you have played uh, substantially sized shows, which helps determine, which helps in their mind solidify your worth as an artist. So if you do this and, and they click on your EPK from that email, it's 50-50 shot if they do that, then it's after that, it's like if they have to click again to listen to your music, it's like a 10% chance that they will actually do that. And then if they have to click again to see something else they want to see about you, it's like 0.001% chance that they're going to click again. So every time someone has to click something, 
to find more information out about you, the chances of them actually seeing that information, the chances of you getting that information in front of them goes down exponentially. It's the reason why my website as a producer, as a, as a mix engineer, et cetera, et cetera, is a single page. You pull it up and it's ordered by the level of importance, what I think is important that I want you to see. But you don't ever have to click on anything to see everything. So that way, the chances of every of people getting all the way through my site is exponentially higher than if my site had like my bio on the first page and then maybe photo a gear list of the studio and then maybe whatever, whatever, whatever. And someone has to click four times to hear the music that I've worked on. No one will ever get there and no one will listen to it. So that concept that you want to make everything as easily accessible to people as humanly possible is super important because the more time someone needs to click, the more they have to search for the info that you want them to see, the less chance there is of them seeing it. So I think that that is a really good uh, base for that conversation. As far as the artist goes, the EPK, uh, your photo is arguably the most important thing. Your photo has to make you look like somebody. Um, when, when a promoter clicks on your EPK and the photo is eh, it, that you already are a 50-50 shot if they're even going to make it to your EPK. And then if your photo is eh, chances are they won't even listen to your music. Your photo has to make you look like somebody, even if you're not. Um, and when they see that, they're like, oh, they take you seriously because you've taken yourself seriously. It's a really good principle to live by. If you don't take yourself seriously, oh, let me rephrase that. Other people will only take you as seriously as you take yourself. No promoter, no fan, no potential client is going to be like, oh, I'll bet they just didn't have the money for a good photo. I'll bet they just didn't have the money for good production as a producer or an engineer. I'll bet he just doesn't have the money for adequate gear to, uh, to make good sounding records. Nobody cares. And this is brutal and blunt, and this is kind of how I am anyway. So sorry, not sorry. Uh, nobody cares. Nobody thinks about that. They just react to what's in front of them. So they hopefully you can get your photo in front of them. And if it's meh, they don't care that you didn't have the money to get a super baller photo. They just think that you're not that serious. And so then they don't listen to your music. So content, this kind of plays into the next thing. Social media. I push this social media thing so hard when I was in a band and when I was doing the artist band thing, it was like the beginning days of my space. And, uh, you couldn't necessarily acquire fans from social media, and you couldn't necessarily book gigs from social media. You had to go out. You had to make phone calls. You had to literally go venue to venue and shake hands. Emails were obviously a thing, but, um, you know, you had to hand flyers out and post flyers up, go to the local record stores and post your fly. I mean, it was just such – it was so difficult 15 years ago when I was doing it that I push this social media thing super hard because it's so much easier now. It's so much easier to get in front of people, to gain a fan base, to have the opportunity to play shows. It's so much easier than it used to be. So that's why I push the social media thing so hard. I think it's the most valuable tool you have as an entrepreneur in 2019. Um, so anyway, going to talk about socials for a bit because this plays, you know, this EPK thing plays into this as well as EPK website thing. There's a bunch of things that I think are super important to, uh, to push your socials. One, high quality, interesting content. If your content is not interesting, nobody will interact with you or follow you just the way that it is. Now, yes, there's a whole bunch of things going on. Instagram right now has their algorithms all screwed up and hashtags aren't working. And yes, there are other factors for sure. But if you do not have high quality, interesting content, people will not be interested in it. Um, and the interesting thing is this is subjective. High quality and interesting is completely subjective based on who you are, what you're doing, 
and the type of people that you should be attracting to your socials. So it's not literally like, oh, I need to buy a super baller camera and I need to have prof- or have professionally produced videos and photos for every single post. That's not necessarily it. It's about being interesting and it's about making the content as good as you can make it. For instance, this video. Let's talk about this right now. I'm going to do this and cut to this so that way you guys can see this. I'm going to, I'm going to show you what's behind me, which not very many of you ever see the backside of my room. Okay, so there we go. Hey, so there's my camera right there. I do have a camera. Um, and that camera is because this iPhone, I couldn't take video on the iPhone that would work for this long format stuff. It literally doesn't work. These lights that are on my walls are literally $15 shop lights from Lowe's or Home Depot. They cost almost nothing. I put them in the wall with those little hooks that you push through the drywall and they curve up and then you can hang stuff on them. They cost whatever, three bucks for a package of those hooks. And the reason why I'm saying this is because those lights make all the difference in the world. You wouldn't even believe what it looks like without those lights on. It it looks like nothing, but they cost $15. So being proactive about doing the best angles, getting some lighting, just just a little bit of effort into creating higher quality content goes such a long ways. It goes forever and makes your content so much better looking and so much more interesting. So have high quality, interesting content. The next thing is is be consistent with the social media thing. Uh, I see, especially companies, I see a lot of companies do this, but it kind of plays into the entrepreneurial thing. I see a lot of companies and entrepreneurs be like, yeah, I'm gonna take my social media seriously and I'm gonna get a bunch of followers and then I'm gonna have made it and that's not how it works. This is a marathon, not a sprint. You have to create high quality, interesting content on a consistent basis for a long, uh, for a long, I seriously can't talk today, for a long amount of time. Um, and you want to be consistent. So I always recommend that you uh, try to set a schedule of posting. For instance, these podcasts, I'm doing one a week. Sometimes it's really hard for me to either come up with the topic or create the whole, like for every episode, I do this thing. Sometimes it's really hard for me to to do this or even to find time to do this once a week. But I've dedicated to once a week. I'm doing this once a week. And you you so you set a schedule and then you be consistent at it. On Instagram, I try to post every other day at a minimum. That's my goal. I fail at that a lot because who does enough interesting stuff every day to post about? None of us do. But the point is set a schedule, whatever works for you and hold yourself to that. And, uh, you know, sometimes like this weekend, uh, this past weekend was Nam. lots of opportunity to create content for say Instagram. Um, and so I've got a backlog now of a couple weeks worth of content just for Instagram because of that one weekend. So it's okay to, it's okay to bank content when you do something cool, document it which I'm getting ahead a little bit here, but document it and show what it is that you do. Um, And it's okay to spread that content out over time. But documenting the things that you do is an important part of of running a a successful social media platform. Excuse me. I see a lot of artists who will be like, oh, I'm in the studio. And they post a photo like this of them in front of a microphone and that's all you ever see. And they might be in like a cool studio, a big studio, but they get one single photo of them in front of a microphone and that's all they got. Um, Or maybe they don't even do that. I see a lot of artists that go in the studio and don't ever even post about it. I think it's a, a good idea to get in a habit of just documenting what it is that you do. You're on your way to a show, document it. You're at the show, document it. Um, you know, you're in the studio, document it, just document everything. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to like film a 
film a documentary, but uh, get in the habit of showing people what it is that you're that you're up to and do it in the most interesting, high quality way that you possibly can. Um, I think it's also as far as your socials go, it's important to be real. Uh, no one likes fake people. And this is social media got so fake so fast that we're kind of seeing the pendulum swing back and like a backlash against that. People want realness. People want real, they, they just want to see who you really are and what you're really doing. It's the reason why these videos have no edits. These podcasts have no edits. And even when I switch formats into the interview style here in a few episodes, there's not going to be any edits. It's just going to be real conversation, just like I'm having with you right now. Um, so be real. Um, I think also part of running your social media is identifying who your demographic is and, and creating content that attracts that particular demographic. For me, um, it's important that like artists and labels and managers are the people that hire me. So for me, it's important that my content attracts artists, labels, and managers. And if I, I mean, it's more than that. If I'm producing or if I'm just mixing, it's other producers that are hiring me to mix uh, or the label that's hiring me to mix. Um, but you, so that's how I approach my socials. You as a, as an artist, you, what you need to attract is fans that will daily consume your music. And so being uh, mindful of I kind of hate that word, mindful. It's becoming such a hot word. Being conscious, that's better. Being conscious of who your target demographic is and trying to create content that that particular demographic would find interesting, which is, again, why this stuff is so hard because it's different for every person and based on what you do and what genre you work in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Create content that is interesting to the people that make the biggest impact on your success. For me, it's labels, managers, artists. If you, as a as for what I do, if you're an artist, it's fans, really fans and promoters. Um, those are the people that you want to create content for. So being conscious of that is super important. Uh, and there's a whole bunch more that I could talk about about the social media thing, but um, I think that that's a that's a good synopsis of, of like hopefully how to do it. Um, I probably should have put all of this stuff in episode number one, but it's, I'm still learning this podcast thing. And that, that was uh, episode one. If you haven't seen episode one on how to make a living, or if you haven't seen any of the episodes, go back and check them out. There's just, I'm patting myself on the back here. There's just such a ridiculous amount of information throughout these episodes that if you watch all of them, it will make, I really believe this, and I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't really believe this, it will make such a big impact on how you conduct yourself and your chances of success and and uh, hopefully helping you know the steps to, to take. Um, almost all of this stuff stems from either when I'm developing someone or questions that I get on social media. Um, or questions I just get from random people at coffee. I go have coffee with with people I've never met all the time. Several times a week, I try to have coffee with someone I've never met. And uh, a lot of all these things are topics that we we end up talking about. They end up coming up. Um, I really, really appreciate all of you that have been sharing. I've been tagged in so many Insta stories and on Facebook. And it seriously means the world to me that you guys are are into this and that you guys are sharing it. And so if you like this, if you got something out of it, consider sharing it with your friends and, and hopefully it will help some of them out as well. And um, again, if, if you like this and you want to keep up to date, uh, if you're on YouTube, click that subscribe and hit the bell icon and uh, hit me up on Instagram at Cole Caparoon and Facebook at Cole Caparoon. And if you want to read more about me and, and hear some of my work, just hit up my website, coltcaparoon.com. And uh, thank you guys for all the support and for watching. And um, you're all literally the best. And, and you all are the reason I'm doing this. So uh, yeah, have a good week. I hope you guys crush the rest of this week. We'll see you later.